All right, so we're going to go ahead and jump into toxicologic emergencies. I didn't realize that this was a very, very, it was long. I didn't realize how long it was. So I'm not 100% sure we're going to get through the complete thing today. But it will give us a, um, it'll definitely give us a jump start. Um, so basically what we're talking about in here is, um, Intentional and unintentional exposure to toxins, toxins being poisons, being drugs, being um, food toxins, being things that we intentionally ingest, inject, take, and things that we're accidentally exposed to. Um, majority of toxin exposures are going to be unintentional or accidental. However, there are some. Uh, Incidents, incidences where intentional poisoning or intentional exposure to toxin will take place, which would be homicide or suicide. And intentional exposure is abuse or misuse of substances used as a mechanism of intentionally harming another person or yourself. Common substances that would fall under the toxicological area would be analgesics, personal and household substances, um, chemicals, sedative hypnotics, antidepressants, CNS uh, medications. The general approach to management of poison patients would be number one, decreasing the exposure. If they're in an environment where they're being exposed, take them out of that environment. If it is a exposure or a toxin that has an antidote, they should receive the antidote. Also, promoting the elimination from the body, whether it's through giving medications to help get it out, um, giving medications to help the substance bind to it, or actually sticking a tube down somebody's throat and, and down their esophagus and lobotomizing it out or pumping their stomach out. Your fatal exposures often include overdoses of CNS uh, medications or substances, things that affect the central nervous system. In pediatric populations, analgesics, batteries, hydrocarbons, gas, plants, and cotton coal preparations. Why it's very important to have things sealed off one of the mindsets that I had to get into when we had our child and she started walking around, which is the fact that I have to lock every single cabinet she can get into because she will get into it. And I know not to mess with it, but she does not know not to mess with it, and she's interested in it. And then you get things that look like candy, little peels. And the kid will pop it in his mouth and if it don't taste good, he thinks it's candy. Or cough syrup. It's got a sweet taste to it. Things like that. Curiosity is what really gets pediatric patients in trouble. So toxicology is the study of prescription and illegal drugs, plant, animal, and other toxins. Each one's placed into a category called a toxidrome. The different, the different toxin, the way that it is introduced, the way it affects the body. It groups uh, toxins and categories by their effects. This is n this. Oh, this is a clicker. So, which of the following is a route in which a toxin can be ingested? Inhalation, absorption, injection, or ingestion? All of the above. Toxins can enter the body just like anything else can, just like medications can, just like allergens can. Inhalation, absorption, injection, ingestion. So kind of what we just talked about. Inhale toxins, fumes, gases, um, either accidental inhalation or puffing. Trying to get high off of uh, breathing in fumes. 
Uh, many toxins can cause damage directly to the skin membrane. Um, and then once they go through the mucous membranes, the skin membranes, where it's men, I'm going insane. <laughs> membranes, once they um, breach that barrier, where do they go? Into the uh, bloodstream causing systemic effect. So a toxin may just be localized, but once it hits the circulation, it's going to cause system wide effects. One eight hundred two 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 one two 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 is the phone number to which agency. Poison control stored in your phone. It's a very commonly used um, resource. Used frequently by home and by hospitals. We used to have patients that would come in for overdose or um, exposure in the unit all the time. They come into the ER, the doctor would call, or the nurse would call poison control, and maybe the family would call poison control before they came in. 24 hours later, they would call and, and talk to us, the IT nurse, to get an update on that patient. Because they store that information in their database. And it helps more research. So anything that, that could potentially be a poison or an exposure, you can call poison control, and they should have information on it. They'll tell you what to do. There's 60 of them across the United States, 24 hours a day. So it's a, it is a resource that you can use as a pre-hospital provider. Um, depending on their nature, Toxins have a number of effects. It could be just common, or it could be things that uh, um, affect particular systems, profound effects, or it could just be systemic. Um, PPE is going to be very, very important, especially in situations where it may be a uh, mass casualty incident. What do you think one, one key indication for, hey, this thing's turned into a mass casualty incident would be? If you see multiple cases go down, experiencing the same signs and symptoms. So your same signs that's going to involve early identification of the hazard. Why would that be important? Yeah, to protect number one, to protect you and your partner, right? Because if you get exposed, you ain't no good. You're just creating another patient. Activation of appropriate resources. If you are not trained. If you are not trained in hazardous materials, if you are not trained to handle these toxins, these situations, don't crawl your butt up into that into that scene. Because what are you going to do? Well, you possibly, but you're definitely going to cause another patient, right? You're going to become another patient if you're not appropriately trained. If you don't have the appropriate PPE, that's where you're going to set up a hot zone and a warm zone. And a cool zone. Alright? And you're going to hang out in the cool zone. For more reasons than one. Because you're cool like the other side of the pillow. <laughs> so, this is where on your assessment sheet that you do, you got to think about request additional resources. It's not always going to just be ALS. It's not always just going to be an additional ambulance. It could be fire department. It could be power company. It could be a hazmat team. Search and rescue. Any of those. Always look for unusual odors. Look for, for, or smell for unusual odors. Look for unusual haze, clouds, vapors. Look for patients acting the same. Multiple unresponsive patients. Multiple patients ambling around like zombies. Um, try to get the name of the substance or substances that the patient's being exposed to. Try to get it the amount they took. All that information is going to be valuable when getting a pre-hospital care report because that's going to aid in the care of that patient. Why do you think patient's weight would be important? Exactly. Right. I may be exposed to something and my little girl may be exposed to the exact same amount of what I was exposed to, 
but she's half my size, a quarter my size, and so what she was exposed to is going to have a lot more detrimental effects on her than it will on me. So they need to be prepared to, to know really what what is um, what's happening. Is this a small patient, a small person? Um, because the effects could be potentiated in a small person. Also, what has been attempted in treatment of the patient prior to your arrival? Now, that's not just going to be, you know, official treatment. That's going to be home remedies. That's going to be, you swallowed a poison and your grandma just told you to drink a gallon of milk. Or you swallowed something and before you know it, grandma's pouring an attack down your throat. Right? You need to know if they've done anything to try to counteract it. Which of the following is a useful resource for identifying hazardous materials on scene? The DOT, emergency response guide, your state protocol, your AMT book, or poison control. Your DOT emergency response guide gives you information on placards and, and different uh, degrees of, of hazardous materials. Also, duration of exposure. So there's a lot of things that's going to the same side of the, we haven't even made it to the patient yet, but there's a lot of information that's going to be involved with patient care. How long were they exposed to it? Also, label information. Transport the container if the, if the kid just drank a gallon of bleach, take the bleach with you. The body kind of has a natural way of, of, of not allowing you to drink bleach and, and, and things like that, drain them and stuff like that that come. But some situations, they can drink it. Just nasty stuff. The body has this thing called a gag reflex, right? <laughs> um, if you're at an industrial setting, where they've been exposed to a chemical, as for the MSDS. Um, out in the field, car wrecks, things like that, tractor trailer wrecks, use your ERG. And then also identify for the potential of poly substance uh, uh, overdoses, meaning more than just one thing. They're not always just going to uh, overdose on just one thing, it may be several things that they've overdosed on. Um, so in your primary assessment, airway, breathing, circulation. Some of the things that they may have been exposed to can inhibit that, can inhibit airway, breathing, or circulation. So you need to be able to identify that quickly because you may have something that can help them out, especially if it's like a, um, a what? What may they over, can overdose on that you can kind of, yeah, because it's an opiate, you can get Narcan. Um, also, if they're on response and they start vomiting, you know, you've got to be sure to keep that airway open. Um, we talked about um, pulmonary edema the other day, and we talked about you've got um, cardiac cause pulmonary edema, and then you've got non cardiac forms of pulmonary edema. Well, toxins are going to be in that category where they, they cause ARDS, which is, um, and they're going to, you're going to get pulmonary edema from certain toxins. All right, so you don't know how to manage an airway, what to do if they're responsive or unresponsive. Look for shock. Why do you think uh, they don't want you to give a syrup of Ipecac? What does Serpa get the cat do? Yeah, it makes you yak, right? Well, there's several reasons why. What goes down, if it's harmful, can be harmful when it comes up, right? Also, can cause forceful vomiting, can impair the airway. Um, so, from what we talked about, what information should you obtain about an exposure patient? What information should you ask for? What the substance they're exposed to, how much they were exposed to it, the amount, when and how long, what else? 
patient's weight, the route, events leading up, was it intentional, unintentional? I think where we take pictures, like I've seen, I get a bunch of and start to have pictures of the get go. Yeah, as long as you don't, you know, take pictures of the patient. Be prepared to perform a head to toe exam and you'll know what to do when the blood glucose. <clears throat> Why do you think that poison can go undetected until the patient tells you to cure it? Alright, compensation. Sometimes it's not necessarily going to be compensation, but sometimes it's absorption, right? Metabolism of that poison. Sometimes it takes a lot longer to metabolize certain poisons than others. Some manifest very quickly. Overdoses on, you know, opiates or alcohol or things like that. But then others just kind of hang out in the body for a while, and then they get metabolized, and then you start seeing um, a lot of the different things that goes on with that particular uh, exposure. Uh, many patients who attempt suicide do so with some methods. What are some of the methods that somebody may try to use exposure to to use the exposure to kill themselves? Ibuprofen. What? Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen? Mm, why do you say that? And it may, ibuprofen doesn't, now Tylenol, on the flip side, Tylenol will kill them, but not quickly. Tylenol affects the liver. Ibuprofen affects more of the stomach area and all that. Um, but yeah, they may try to drink some antifreeze. I know folks that used to kill dogs that way, giving them antifreeze. And it had kind of a sweet taste to it. What about carbon monoxide? They may close their garage, put a pipe on their exhaust pipe, and pipe it into their uh, car. And then maybe just taking a bunch of pills or something like that. Um, so bottom line, you're gonna you're going to provide supportive treatment. The majority of all toxins do not have specific antidotes. Uh, narcotic overdoses for us, we can give Narcan, right? We can maintain airway, but bottom line, ABCs, IV, fluids, things like that, it's going to be just about our, our only treatment. Now, activated charcoal could be involved in that. However, activated charcoal is not in your Alabama protocols anymore. But activated charcoal is an adsorbent. An adsorbent. Which, and it's just alcohol. I mean, not alcohol. It's Charcoal. I saw alcohol in there, so. Um, yeah, just listen real closely again. A poison is any substance that can harm the body, sometimes seriously enough to create a medical emergency. Once on or in the body, a poison may act as a corrosive or irritant, destroying skin and other body tissues. A poisonous gas can act as a suffocating agent. Systemic poisons harm the entire body or specific organ systems. Commonly, poisons act on the central nervous system to depress or overstimulate the brain. Activated charcoal is used in cases of ingested poisons and works through adsorption, the process of one substance becoming attached to the surface of another. Ordinary charcoal adsorbs some substances, but activated charcoal is different because it has been manufactured to have many cracks and crevices. By ingesting activated charcoal, the poisons bind to the increased surface area and are eliminated by the body. There you go. So basically it's just you open it up, you pour it in, uh, into a cup or something, and there's this uh, stuff, it's usually like a little squeeze thing that has a little bit of chicken flavor in it, and try to get them to drink it. If you ever have seen somebody that has taken charcoal, it is nasty to get it 
color the same. Then, of course, reassess because the level of toxin may be metabolized and may actually be increasing in the body as it's metabolizing. So be sure that you're watching for specific signs and symptoms. Anticipate deterioration. Once it really gets in their system good, they could get worse off. If a narcotic is, if narcotic is suspected cause of unresponsiveness and respiratory depression, you should. Carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Where does sarin come from? I know it's been walking on this. I'll tell you all the answer. Why is pulse on oximetry? It's not work. Unreliable and suspected carbon monoxide poisoning because the hemoglobin has a higher affinity for carbon monoxide um, than it does for oxygen. It likes that CO better than it likes O2. So, carbon monoxide, colorless and odorless, uh, very dangerous. Takes over the hemoglobin. If it takes over the hemoglobin, what does that mean? Yeah, it's going to process before you die. Right, oxygen cannot be transported. There's no room on the hemoglobin, which is the vehicle for oxygen to be transported, right? Um, once it's inhaled, it quickly is absorbed across the respiratory membrane and then it not off that oxygen, so it, it can affect that patient very quickly. Um, cause the cellular hypoxia, and of course, a lot of your central nervous system issues that you see when you become hypoxic, confusion, um, also vomiting increases. Um, Sympathetic nervous system, that's a good hand in tachycardia, hypothermia. Um, signs and symptoms of severe poisoning, some of the things that we just talked about. Um, also, ataxia, not being able to walk, seizures, unconsciousness, rhabdomyolysis. What is rhabdomyolysis? Yeah, break down skeletal muscle, break down the muscles. Renal failure, it's a bad deal. So, some of the same symptoms of carbon monoxide poisoning could be some of the same symptoms of a night out on the town. <laughs> so, treatment. What do you think treatment will be for carbon monoxide poisoning? Lots and lots of oxygen and getting them away from the source, right? They need to get oxygen by um, non-rebreather mask, no matter what. And then, really, further treatment is probably going to be to go to the hospital and to be uh, treated in a hyperbaric treatment chamber, which helps push the oxygen gas out, I mean, the carbon monoxide gas out of the system. Kind of the same thing that, that a hyperbaric chamber would do for nitrogen or things like that. And then, of course, IV and fluid administration if they're hypotensive. Most important actions, recognition, scene safety, management, ABCs, and reducing the exposure. Found in several products, prevalent route is home fires. It's also a cellular asphyxiant.
Sanan, Sanan. Uh, cyanide to cellular is fixing that prevents energy production at a cellular level. Death can occur very quickly. Obviously, it's um, well. Let's let's answer this one real quick. What is the most prevalent cause of cyanide poisoning? Ingestion in fruit pits, house fires, industrial exposure, or product tampering? House fires. House fires. So it's found in several, cyanide is found in several uh, products or items, often um, part of combustion and house fires. Also found in, in some fruit pits as well. I don't usually eat fruit pits. Um, death occurs very, very quickly. So they say they smell like bitter almonds. I couldn't tell you what not bitter almonds smell like, so I'm not sure what bitter almonds smell like. But if you smell them, suspect cyanide. Um, a lot of the, the same central nervous system uh, affects... Why would the pulse oximetry be high but the patient may be, the patient be hypoxic? So it doesn't necessarily bind the hemoglobin. Fine, that does it. So there is oxygen. That's right. So it's blocking, it's a cellular asphyxiant, which means it's blocking the, the oxygen from getting into the cell. Almost like if you have high blood sugar, right? You got high blood sugar. The sugar in the blood's high, but the cell's not being able to use it. The oxygen is high, but the cell's not being able to use it. Does that make sense? Um, signs and symptoms reflect hypoxia and acidosis. Maybe given um, activated charcoal if it's ingested. But there is a specific antidote for cyanide. What do y'all think it is? Hydroxocobalamin, a three-part cyanide antidote kit includes vitamin B12, amyl nitrate, um, oh, I'm sorry, vitamin B12 is a hydrocobalamin or there's a three-part cyanide antidote kit which includes amyl nitrate, sodium nitrate, and sodium thiosulfate. Um, a lot of situations, uh, you may get called out to do a standby at a house fire. Um, ambulance goes out with Auburn, don't they, when you have a house fire. Um, firefighters can be exposed to this stuff, right? So be on guard for that and be looking for specific, like, carbon monoxide or cyanide poisoning. Coagulation necrosis is a result of strong acids contacting the skin or strong alkalis contacting the skin. Who's, who's just taking a stab in the dark at this? Everybody just about? Did you know it? You read it? Pretty confident answer that. So coagulation necrosis is a result of a strong acid contact in the skin. So we'll get into toxic substances that cause chemical burns when in contact with the body, acids and alkalis, um, and really actually pretty nasty um, things. Um, 
What are some of your caustic household substances? What are things that you can think of? Bleach, yeah, Drano, ammonia, chemicals, swimming pool chemicals, battery acid, batteries, hair laxers. Okay. <laughs> detergent. Strong detergent. Nice. Way to way to way to read your book for once this semester. <laughs> so, um, showing as acids on the skin that cause coagulation necrosis, showing alkalis cause liquefaction necrosis. What do you think liquefaction necrosis? Well, it's exactly like it sounds. The tissues are liquefied. So that right there, I believe, is. This right here is definitely the liquefaction process. It's kind of just liquefying all the tissue. It's a heel. Um, if ingested, acid or alkalized result in the erosion of the esophagus and the stomach lining. Uh, it can cause severe hemorrhage and severe pain. Never induce vomiting in patients with caustic ingestion. Why? It's going to further cause damage. And the stomach is designed to, to have acid in it, right? It, it's got acid. So, of course, we don't want this caustic substance in the body, but we want to get it out in a safer way than just get them to throw it back up, right? They can lodge it out or something like that, right? Um, some, some of the signs and symptoms, skin irritation, burns to the mouth and tongue. Hemolytic hemolytic, what is that? Vomiting blood, strider, hoarseness, difficulty breathing. You should only use water to neutralize a patient who has been burned by caustic substance because water will cool the skin, water will rehydrate him. The use of the antidote can result in significant heat release or the use of the antidote can result in significant cold release. So it's asking you, why should water be the only substance you use to neutralize? So some chemicals, some caustic substances may have a another agent that will neutralize them. All right. Here in the chemical chemistry lab, and one substance will neutralize the other substance. But in the process of that that neutralization, it reacts and it produces heat. Right. So let's just an, an example. You're at a chemistry lab. You get called to a chemistry lab and somebody's been burned by some type of chemical. Well, the chemi chemical, the chemistry professor says, hey, I've got this. I know it'll neutralize that. You wouldn't want to pour that on because that's going to cause heat. It's going to cause a reaction. All right. So water is your, your universal neutralizer, your universal solvent for all of these chemicals. Now, there are certain um, situations where water reacts with um, those chemicals. Um, magnesium is one of them. I don't really know what to do in that situation. I do know that uh, old uh, VW Bug engines used to be made out of magnesium. And when you would spray magnesium with water, it arcs up and it has this huge reaction. Um, don't expose other providers, get them out of that situation. Definitely remove contaminated clothing and jewelry before you get them on the back of the ambulance. Um, flush dermal and ocular exposures with copious amounts of water, only using water. So flush, 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 flush. All right. Um, activated charcoal should not be used in caustic substances. Airway management may be complicated, especially if they have ingested it. 
You want to get on that airway and manage it as quickly as possible. Non-visualized airways, which are going to be what you guys would do, are contraindicated because you cannot see the amount of damage that's down there. And you also run the risk, just as you would with an innovation, but you can actually visualize it, but you run the risk of pushing some of that acid down into the uh, lungs and aspirating as well. So exposure to, to concentrated acids and alkalis can result in some really, really bad injuries. The deliberate concentration and inhalation of vapors or fumes to achieve intoxication. Puffing, smoking, eating or puffing. hydrocarbons. Um, exposure can occur through any route. Folks also will hug gas and things like that. Um, this is always where I interject. Uh, I read an article about five or six years ago about these folks that figured out a way to get hot off of pee and poop. Yes, I said pee and poop. They would uh, pee and poop in a pot set it off to the side, let it ferment, and they would uh, pull the top off, and they would start puffing the fumes coming off of it, and they get high, so it's a hallucination thing. It's pretty desperate, pretty desperate. So, yeah. Um, CNS um, issues, which is some of the main reasons why they cut the hydrocarbons, um, also, cardiovascular actually can cause sudden cardiac arrest. Also, GI issues can affect just about any part of the body. Um, so, more than likely, if you if you have to deal with it, you probably be faced with somebody that's getting hunting. So this guy had he just about to drink the whole can of spray paint, looks like. Be sure to, to do a good assessment and you know what are we gonna do for these patients? Yeah, that's gonna be it. We're just gonna symptomatically treat them, get them to the hospital. Now there is something, believe it or not, called sudden sniffing death syndrome, SSDS. It's usually where I throw in a fart joke or something like that, but I'm tired. Uh, and basically, it's just where their myocardium gets uh, sensitive to this, and the heart just uh, it reacts to these effects of your catecholamines, your epinephrine, your norepinephrine, and it's just part of this whole huffing thing here. So they could die from huffing. Commonly abused substances. Getting pretty hard up. <laughs> Organophosphates. Y'all talked about this before. Organophosphates. Where are they found? What are they found Pesticides. in? Pesticides. Was part of the whole Agent Orange thing back in Vietnam. They dropped it on all the soldiers. Where does it? Where are organophosphates? What what uh, part of the body do they affect? The parasympathetic nervous system, which causes sludge. Salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastric distress, emesis. Um, yep. Scene safety, just like everything else, avoid exposure. Now, 
there is a antidote for this that you will have on your ambulance as mandated by Homeland Security and FEMA and all that. What is it? We talked about it before. Atropine and one other drug. Prolidoxamine. A Mark One kit. Now, the thing about these kits are that they're not necessarily for the patient. They're for you and your partner if you get exposed. Um, nerve agents, still a concern, um, can be used for um, weapons of mass destruction. Still pose a very real concern. So, this term is for rapid and voluntary eye movement. Exposed to methanol, um, one of the telltale signs, blindness or blurred or cloudy vision, also called meth um, also part of methanol poisoning. And the other signs and symptoms you see there. What is rubbing alcohol called? Alcohol. It's also 
put a disinfectant. However, when you're desperate and you need alcohol, you will drink whatever will give you that buzz, including running alcohol. These have some really, really bad effects. Twice as drunk, twice as sick, twice as long. Um, obvious or hidden containers of I isopropanol, uh, I'm sorry, isopropanol, that word, isopropyl alcohol, con containing products should increase your suspicion for intoxication. But check for other causes of altered mental status, such as drug trauma and hypoglycemia. Um, somebody who's working in Dixie, that's when we were in high school, said there was a lady that would come in about once every two or three days, and she would go and buy strawberry extract because it had a very high alcohol content in it, and she would drink that to get her buzz. This is all been found in radiator antifreeze, ethylene, rubbing alcohol, methanol, or ethanol. <coughs> Ethylene glycol, ethylene glycol. Leave on a small amount of sweet tasting. That's why folks would kill their neighbor's dog with it because they put it out for the dog to drink because it was real sweet tasting. Why don't most pediatric poisonings occur? It's usually because of curiosity, right? Underdeveloped sense of taste, the inability to determine if something is poison or not. Need a break? Food toxins, botulism. We talked about that the other day. Toxins produced by infectious agents. Some seafoods contain dangerous toxins as well. Um, histamine fish poison causes uh, signs, uh, signs and symptoms of, uh, similar to allergic reactions. Affected fish can have an off flavor. I'm not going to eat a fish that has an off flavor. You would treat it just like you would a allergic reaction. Plant toxins can include things like poison oak, poison ivy, poison sumac, but also mushrooms and things like that. Several different types of poisonous plants. Cyanide can be found in fruit pits. Colchicine. Found in the autumn crocus and the meadow saffron that you have growing in your backyard. And all this other stuff you see here. The belladonna. It's actually where atropine comes from. Jensen weed. The purple foxglove is where you get certain medications called cardiac glycoside. Dijoxin is one of them. Um, so the Jensen weed can be smoked or drunk as a tea, has posted anti effects. You can remember this. Mad as a hatter, dry as a bone, red as a beef, blind as a bat, hot as hay. Then you got folks that eat mushrooms and get high, like Mario. Poison ivy is sucks if you're allergic to it. 
So what are you going to do if somebody's been intoxicated by a plant? And tear away. Symptomatically treat them, right? You need to determine what they think they're exposed to. You can make a digital picture. Venom. I think there's a, been a big incidence of uh, rattlesnakes this year out and about. Um, most of your venomous insects and animal bites cause local discomfort, but some can produce some pretty severe uh, systemic effects, especially if you're allergic to them. Um, this is the brown recluse. I saw a thing the other day about a family that was forced out of their home because there's like 5,000. I burned that place down here. <laughs> Brown foot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, one thing. <laughs> one identifying factor with a brown recluse is that he's called a fiddle bag. Kind of looks like a fiddle. While there is no specific pre hospital treatment for a bite from a brown recluse, it is important to recognize the severity of the bite because. <laughs> Severe tissue necrosis can occur. So the brown recluse is found in the Midwest and the South. Um, it's called a brown recluse because it likes to be a recluse. It likes to live in seclusion. Oftentimes, you won't even know if you've been bit, but within eight hours, there's increase in pain, uh, swelling, redness, um, eventually leads to substantial necrosis. I know a guy that got bit by a brown recluse, like, I guess 10 years ago now, 11 years ago, and he actually is, is, has died since then, but he never really recovered from, from that bite in his leg. Um, he constantly had issues with his legs and all that. Um, so... This is kind of the progression of a brown recluse. This is four days after it's kind of spreading out. Then after it gets really bad, it has to be debrided. Oh. <laughs> so your black widows, I've had a ton of those. The closest I've ever had to an anxiety attack was when I found a black widow like, this close from my face under my girdle when I was looking at it. <laughs> so, you know how to identify a black widow, right? Shiny black, red hour, or orange hourglass shape. Only the female bite is dangerous. But it's a neurotoxin it causes some pretty bad stuff for you. Scorpions. No, scorpions aren't dangerous enough to really cause a fatality. The bark scorpion is the only one to cause a fatality. Period. Mostly seen at night, found beneath objects during the day. Um, I got stung by one whenever I was when I was younger out at the lake, and it hurt pretty bad. Anybody else ever been stung by a scorpion? Um, so, with this one, you would actually apply loose constricting bands, is what they're recommending, to uh, slow the distribution of a toxin. You wouldn't do that for some of the other snake bites. Well, usually, I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but usually with brown recluse, by the time you really realize that it's, it's like a brown recluse, you've already had that spread and all that.
that the, the fang. You can identify them by the bird fly slit and the tip around the nostril. <laughs> Hey, are everywhere. Everywhere. These are your rattlesnakes, water moccasins, copperheads, all of which call the South home. Who? Which one is 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 worse? Which which bite is worse from a young water young one. Right, a, a young pit viper as opposed to an older one because it doesn't have the control of the release of its uh, venom or maturity to the birds that are Um. So, one another way that you can identify a venom snake is by its triangular head, um, and also. But it's got its fangs, and then with a non venomous snake, it's got the um, like U shape with a, it's got teeth. Oh my. This is all examples of what a snake bite will call. Last fall, when I was still working in the unit, I actually had a guy that got bit by a baby pit viper, like right here. And, like his whole arm got all swollen up and it like turned black all the way up here. But he actually had a severe, severe allergic reaction to the venom, like worse than other folks would have. And he ended up on the ventilator. He had a poker, but he was really, really sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have. Right there, right, right here, they cut. Because it's uh um, because of the swelling that the rattlesnake body or the venom will cause, it starts compressing the tissue, so they have to do um, uh, cut its up arm. Um, neither ice nor constricting bands are applied, and in, in, in the case of the uh, pit viper envenomation, it's because the constricting band will cause further damage to the tissue. Um, transport to a facility that, is, that has and can rapidly uh, obtain anti-venom. East Alabama can. Um, usually they have to get it from Montgomery or, or Columbus, um, but they can obtain it. Your coral snakes, they're not pit vipers. Um, they use a chewing motion to inject the venom. The way that you identify it is red on black, red on black, venom light, red on yellow, kill a fella. <laughs> red on black, red on black, red on yellow. He's dead. Snakes is snake. Um, it's usually a rare um, bite. It's a potent neurotoxin, so it's going to have the same, a lot of the same CNS effect. You would apply a compression bandage on a bit All right, marine animals. Moving quick through this. All right. Very, very small chance that you're going to encounter a jellyfish, a sea urchin, a man of war, or a stingray at Lake Martin or Lake Martin. However, I was just down at the beach two weeks ago and there was freaking jellyfish everywhere. Um, most of the time it's just going to cause localized, uh, localized pain, irritation, redness. Um, the Portuguese man of war is that, that big old jellyfish that you see pictures of is, is what will kill somebody. What? Activation of heat and activation of 
examine the lead to pain and local reactions. Um, if, if it is an animal that has stingers uh, scrubbing the area uh, or squeezing, tweezing the stingers, may release more venom. So you want to kind of scrape the stingers off. Um, in most cases, the patient will be able to relate a clear history of the bite. Um, in some cases, like with the brown recluse, they may not even know that they were bit. I don't know how you're bit by, be bit by a coral snake. You know, I know it, but I guess it could happen. All right. So look, we are very, very close to finishing this chapter, believe it or not, in less than an hour. So let's just move on. Let's just keep trucking and finish this up, and then we'll be done with this chapter. Okay? Um, so now we're going to talk a little bit about prescription over-the-counter medications. Um, yeah, over-the-counter medications can be some of the, uh, the deadliest, most lethal medications somebody can ever do. So this medication can cause liver failure within 24 hours. Yep, you guessed it. Let's see the medicine. Acetaminophen. It can be one of those where somebody wasn't really trying to kill themselves. <laughs> but they still took a whole bunch of medication and in reality potentially killed themselves. Just not as quick. Um, Tylenol is the top five medic in the top five medications with the largest number of associated fatalities. It's a dangerous, dangerous medication. Usually it's uh, asymptomatic in that overdose. Aspirin. What could aspirin an overdose of aspirin cause? Acidosis. What's the name of it? Salicylic acid. Right? It can cause acidosis. And in severe cases, heart failure, dysrhythmia, pulmonary disease. Other over-the-counter medications, antihistamines, Claritin, Benadryl, Iron, if you poison yourself with iron or a kid, it results in death and it interferes with cellular energy production. What is a day break drug, Rohypnol, classified as? It is a sedative hypnotic. Other uh, prescription medications, benzodiazepine, sedative hypnotics, narcotics, the good stuff. What do you got to look for? Altered mental status, signs and symptoms of altered mental status, signs and symptoms of overdose. Most of them do not have an um, antidote. Some benzos do, well benzos do, and narcotics do. Um, there is an antidote for Tylenol. Overdose, right? Acetaminophen overdose. Um, it's called muca mist. Muca mist. And it smells like rotten egg. Muca <laughs> mist. Yeah, they use it. Yeah. yeah. They use it to clear out the Yeah. And they sing too, didn't they? Yeah. And it also, it also helps with uh, overdose. So your benzos, we talked about them earlier. Or should they be called glories? <laughs> oh man, oh, I didn't do that for y'all. Um, prescription medications, narcotics, opiates. You got synthetic and semi-synthetic narcotics. What are we going to give? Naloxone. <laughs> Antidepressants, there are some particularly bad um, antidepressants that um, can really mess the body up. Cyclic antidepressants, also called tricyclic antidepressants, and MAOIs. If you ever watch a uh, commercial for a drug, 
it's always going to say, if you're on triticyclic antidepressants or MAOIs, please consult your physician before taking these medications because they do not play well with other medications at all. And then you've got the other types of antidepressants, what we talked about, Sarah, uh, the SSRIs and all these right here. Neither really here nor there for us at this point. The TCAs, tricyclic antidepressants, um, we'll see anticholinergic signs and symptoms, which was what? What was it, the anticholinergic signs and symptoms? Anticholinergic, dry and everything up, right? Cholinergic effects, they're saying pours out where you have sludge and all that. Anticholinergic, where you dry, everything dries up. Um, and this is the MAOI that I was just talking about. And you can't eat food containing tyramine. Um, uh, antipsychotic medications. There can be some effects of those. We talked about the catatonia, also um, called. Can't think of it right now. Um, there's effects that also you can um, get from. Um, you know. This neuroleptic malignant syndrome. It, it's. Um, something that a person is taking antipsychotic medication, they all of a sudden lose control of their body temperature and it just gets super, super high and they get very, very sick. I, we've actually, I've seen a patient with it in the unit before. Um, lithium, use it bipolar, we talked about that earlier. Cardiac medication toxicity. Um, <clears throat> depending on what it is, is it a medication that slows the heart rate down? You take too much, it's going to slow the heart rate way down. It's going to drop your blood pressure, right? Um, as is the case of beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, um, we'll see some issues with uh, lowering the heart rate and lowering blood pressure. Digoxin, digitalis. It is a medication, it's an antidysrhythmic. It's taken with folks that have atrial fibrillation. One of the things that's in particular, you'll learn about this again in medical school, is that they get a, 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 a haze over their eyes when they overdose on digitalis. So remember, not all patients with narcotic part in the Lexon administration, why are we going to give them the Lexon? <laughs> Respiratory depression, right? To help with breathing. We don't want to give Narcan enough to what? To get them awake, right? And it's not because we don't want to be bothered by them. It's because we don't want them to start suffering from withdrawal-like symptoms. Um, cocaine, street drugs, stimulants. Can be inhaled in powder form or injected as a liquid. And crack cocaine, very impure form of cocaine, is smoked. How do you do that? <laughs> um, with cocaine, it's relatively short acting. Asher James, Mitch up. It is a stimulant, it, it, and so it stimulates the sympathetic nervous system, right? So it's going to cause some major constriction. It's going to cause increased heart rate. It can also cause dysrhythmias. One of the first cardiac arrests I worked, even before I was a paramedic, was the effect of a cocaine overdose. And she went into VFib and VTAC, went inside to do CPR on her and all that. Um, I've heard stories of, of folks swallowing baggies of cocaine and, and stuff, trying to hide from the cops and actually going into cardiac arrest. Recreational drugs. Kind of like to have reparation. Amphetamines, diet pills, ADD, ADHD medications. Very, very, very common in a college town. Uh, 
Um, if taken as prescribed, you don't want to have any issues. However, some folks like to take Adderall and snort it. Because it works quicker, but it's also very dangerous. Hallucinogens. PCP. This is a disassociative anesthetic. It totally just disassociates you from reality, and you feel no pain. You feel nothing. These are the kind of people that uh, can walk down the street and get tased five or six times and just rip the tasers out. They're a risk for excited delirium. So this is a state of del uh, delirium, but it's um, very, very, very excited. Um, everything is like in way overdrive, and excited delirium can be a cause of death. Activate law enforcement early if they're not there. These patients can become hypothermic very quickly because of the excited delirium. LSD it is derived from the ergofungus, also known as acid. LSD causes some psychological effects. Anxiety, pain is tripping on acid. Um, hallucinogens, a couple of um, other ones. You've got mescaline from the peyote cactus. And then this other one, I can't pronounce his name. Um, mushroom. IV drug abuse, um, heroin, opiates, and that. There's actually a push for uh, Narcan, for the cops to be carrying Narcan, and actually they can make Narcan available over the counters as well. Um, you got your different types of narcotics, you got your natural occurring ones, heroin, morphine, codeine, and then your synthetic ones. Um, what street drugs are a particular problem in this area? What? Okay. I agree cocaine, but the, I think more than being cocaine is going to be crack cocaine. Um, meth is big. Weed. Um, especially in a college town, um, routine rules were hitting on, you know, anything like that, big time. And some other drugs of abuse, you got your Georgia homeboy, <laughs> GHB, ketamine, um, dextrometho, dextromethorphan is actually in coffee. Um, it is what folks trip up off of when they're doing the robo tripping. Uh, I think uh, scissor. Um, do what? Robo tripping. Um, they mix all syrup and alcohol together and things like that. It's pretty dangerous. So, anyway, that concludes medical.